All right, people, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification. That way, you'll know when I upload the next video and you'll be supporting my channel. Follow me on Twitter. Every time I upload a new video, I'll be tweeting. Ladies and gents, almost as you react, and this is Stalker set of a Chernobyl review by the channel Mandalore Gaming. Yeah, I started doing a Mandalore Gaming review so, uh, since yesterday. I did the Factorio one. Uh, people have been telling me to do that. I'm like, yeah, why the hell not? But apparently, there's still a stack. Only sells a Chernobyl of the trilogy. Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, the introduction is epic in its own self, right? So, set of Chernobyl is fine. So, a Stalker review. Why the fuck not? One of my favorite games ever. Right, so if there's a stalker review, of course, I'm gonna check that out first. The stalker set of the Chernobyl review covers a survival FPS with horror and RPG elements that remains relevant with a strong core game and a vibrant modding community. Yeah, see, the, the only, re, only way I can explain why stalker is so good, I mean, you can't really quantify it, right? If you list off things like what what is in the game, what mechanics are there, right? If the story, but not much a story. That what is what is inside the stalker that is so good? That's the thing you can't really explain it. This is where the word immersion comes, right? Immersion. Word gets thrown around a lot, but you know if a game is truly immersive, right? Like the music, the setting, the way they created a game, every small thing in there just combine and create this environment that is just perfect, right? Very few games can do that. Stalker is definitely top of the list when it comes to immersion, right? Something about it is just too good. And games, storyline or anything that game tries to do, right? Or at least tries to give you a quest or something, that doesn't make Stalker great, right? Just random things make Stalker great, right? You, you come across uh, or, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, a, I don't know, structure or something, then you're like, okay, everything's fine. Then suddenly you hear you hear some kind of eerie music and like, okay, what the fuck is that? And then you realize, holy shit, that's a snorker there. Suddenly it comes out of, a, I guess, camo or whatever they do, invisibility thing, and you just get scared, right? And the, the way the whole lighting system is, dark feels proper dark, right? The music screams in the distance. Right, everything is incredible, and obviously the structure system that developers did in the first game, at least, right, the way you go through maps feels like a journey, right? So things get revealed to you slowly. First, you encounter Snorker, I guess, in army warehouses. Army warehouses? No, wait a minute, not warehouses. That army base in, uh, I guess, uh, the map you go through the garbage, the left side. I forgot the name. Agroprom? I think it's Agroprom. In that time, in, in that underground, you first time encounter a snorker, and that's a fucking epic experience. After that, you go to Yantar or something, you encounter that psychic uh, guy or something, right? And same aggro prom thing, that, you, that, that other guy you encounter, right? Who, I guess, pulls you through his psi ability at the end of that aggro prom underground. And in the Yantar thing, there's some kind of a lightning ghost type of thing that throws things at you. So slowly you discover things, right? And Clear Sky is just like Seros of Chernobyl, but it's kind of a different, a bit better. Not better as in better things that I like, you know, there's a, a a unit that you you can find anomalies with and some changes in there. It's not better than Seros of Chernobyl, right? It's the least favorite game of people. But I guess some features added to it in that sense. And then Call of Pripyat is kind of like amping up Seros of Chernobyl. Just, you know. So, okay, I've been talking way a lot. So let's watch it. Uh, let's see how Mandalore talks about it. I hope Mandalore is a fan of Stalker, so in that way the review is going to be epic. If somebody first time I come across this, it's going to be hit and miss, right? Whether they like it or not. So let's watch it. This is Stalker. A lot of people consider it to be a cult classic. With good reason, too. It's pretty compelling. The thing is, I've heard an equal amount of people trashing this game and loving it. It's easy to see why it's treasured when there's many moments like these. But then things just fall apart. So why is this game still talked about a decade later? whereas the Soviet film loosely based off of it called Stalker came out in 1979. But before I get into that, I should give you the setting of the game. 
The first game takes place in 2012 Chernobyl. About All right. So I guess Roadside Picnic uh, is the novel that came before the Chernobyl disaster, right? So in that, I guess the storyline, if I remember correctly, is around the alien, right? Aliens are the result of things. Zone is some kind of a maze type of thing. And aliens are some kind of, yeah. So in the game, when the developers created status, status of Chernobyl, they tweaked that. They removed the alien element from it and they added the Chernobyl disaster, right? Like the nuclear coal, elephant's foot, whatever that is, right? They put sarcophagus there, right? And uh, I guess uh, put the zone around it, right? And made that as the center of thing, like nuclear disaster, created all these mutants and everything. They tweaked that a bit. And that was so good uh, addition because they could have kept the novel as a whole and created the, the whole game based around aliens or whatever. But this real world element of it actually adding Chernobyl disaster as the core of it, tweaking that, that made the game perfect. Every time you play the game, you have this like, oh, I don't know the Chernobyl disaster. Oh, look at that. I'm walking on Chernobyl. Then there you have this feeling. The more you ga play the game, obviously story takes you closer to the center of the zone. So you have this mental image like I'm slowly coming closer to that disaster of Chernobyl plant. Right? And by the end of it, you go through everything. You go through the Pripyat city and everything. You're like, oh my god, I'm going to look at that fucking chimney and that uh, plant. And in the last mission, you go like, oh god damn, look at that. That feels like a journey, right? Whole game feels like a journey. That is the best thing ever. Six years after a second disaster occurred there. What went wrong the second time is a mystery, but the zone has become even more inhospitable. Reality itself seems to be breaking inside the zone of alienation. There are physics breaking anomalies, strange creatures, and that's already on top of the radiation. At the same time, some items have been transformed into artifacts with strange properties. Look at that. People are willing to pay a high price for these artifacts, so some will jump the fence and risk it all to steal them. There's also a legend of something being in the center of the zone that will grant a wish to anyone who makes it. Okay, so just how much of that is from the book or the movie? Well, all three have a zone, people break into it, and there's something in there that might grant wishes. And that's about it. You do have to keep in mind that these were made before the Chernobyl disaster in 86. Though one of the final scenes in the movie does have this look at a power plant. That's kind of spooky. In fact, quite a lot of visuals in the movie seem to have made it into the game. They're very different genres, but the visual inspiration's pretty cool. If I heard today that an old Soviet art film was being made into a game, I probably wouldn't be thrilled. Because most likely it would be made by the- You need to understand that before the Chernobyl disaster, uh, before those few decades when nuclear plants were, I guess, becoming more rampant, there was a real fear around uh, nuclear plants because of the nuclear bomb. It got a, you know, bad rap, right? You don't want in fault line this and that. So even Chernobyl thing didn't happen, people had fear of nuclear plants. So if you're trying to make something scary, of course you're gonna show a power plant, right? Because oh, the disaster, whatever. Sometimes people are like, oh look at that, they foreshadowed that, they predicted that. It's not much of prediction, it's more much of that they had the fear of that long before this, right? And then the Chernobyl disaster happened. So they didn't really predict it something by showing that, but oh, plant, they were already, uh, there was science, uh, you know, were not as, uh, scientific knowledge were not as spread around at the time and people were extremely afraid of, you know, nuclear power plants. Chinese room, be under half an hour and probably suck. Now the USSR state committee said the film wasn't very good anyways. It's definitely slow, but I don't see why they'd be so upset about it. Uh-oh. Comparing it to the game, the book is a better fit. After all, it's the one that has the artifact hunters. But enough about the background for now. Let's talk about Shadow of Chernobyl. You play as an unnamed stalker, which is the name given to the zone trespassers. Like most mid-2000s video games, you have amnesia. Your only guidance is a palm pilot <laughs> telling you to kill someone named Strelok and an acronym tattooed on your forearm. And that's it. Go wild. Well, good hunting, stalker. Looking at the graphics first, Stalker's pretty good for a game that's a decade old. It's another one of those cases where good lighting can really help hide a game's age. Some of the texture work is just as good as stuff I've seen in modern games. Though things like- Don't Sonic pause too much, but lighting is extremely important when it comes to games. People who are like casual gamers would not realize this, but there is a reason why ENBs in games make transform the games. ENBs are literally changing of lighting and things like that, right? I mean, ENB gets, uh, I guess, more stronger and stronger as the year go by and some other additions are put into it, but it's mostly lighting changes. RTX was such a big thing, even though people say it's not gonna be much there, but yeah, it is. Because it's, it, I guess, changed how light behave in an engine. That's everything, right? Lighting is extremely important, uh, how you do a lightning. So, you know, when a game does the lightning just right, it doesn't have to be realistic, it has to be just right for the game. 
which stalker has every look at that even this when you play it it gives you a different feeling if somebody created you know remade stalker in some different engine with different lighting i don't know if it would capture the same experience the character models and their animations show that yeah this is an older game jumping right into art direction what really stands out to me is the environments stalker is chock full of atmosphere the weather effects it has impressed me even today. So even with all the older models and awkward animations, it still draws me in. Even in empty areas, the zone just feels so surreal and otherworldly. So I love the look of the zone. Don't get me wrong, I really like some of the mutant designs and the exoskeletons look cool, but the scenery is just so immersive. It's a show stealer. Yeah. The accompanying sound design is also pretty kick-ass. That could also be a big part of it. Every small detail made this game great. I don't know if they intended that, it just happened like that, but I don't know. So the immersion is killer, but what about the gameplay? It's gonna be a rough adjustment. No, Shadow it's Chernobyl has great. some what RPG about? elements. There's a main storyline you can follow, but there's also lots of optional missions. Your rewards range between items and money. There's no experience bar, and there's no level up system. But Wait a minute. I got the family rifle, some sort of, I got that one, hunting shotgun, which is not in the game, right, but it's just for the quest. How did that change it? Some kind of a mod change it? Because in vanilla, right, no modded game, I guess it's the double barrel, not double barrel, hunting shotgun, the big one. Right, that is not in the Saras of Chernobyl, they removed it for whatever reason, but it's part of that quest. But this won't stop people from calling a Ukrainian sure. shooter Russian Fallout. Anyways, your inventory is managed using a grid system, but there's also a carrying capacity. The more you carry over 50 kilograms, the less stamina you'll have for sprinting. If you hit 60, you go to a dead stop. So if you go full klepto and try to pick up everything you see, you'll run into problems pretty quickly. Yeah, the game world is made is up of interconnected definitely. large areas, so balancing your mobility with the supplies you need is important. Someone in a trade hub might be willing to buy all the heavy guns you found, but people in the field might not. So this forces you to put some planning into the supplies you'll take into the field. Plus, you don't want to go hungry. Now would be a good time to talk about the 200, difficulty. 250 a lot of ammo misconceptions max. come from the game being so vague at times. The way difficulty works is the lower the difficulty, the less damage bullets will do across the board. This means you and your enemies will take more shots to kill. The lower difficulty also means that enemies will have a harder time hitting you. Now I don't know how this rumor started. It might have been from a giant bomb article. But the gist is a lower difficulty makes the player character less accurate and their bullets disappear on hitting the enemy. This isn't true. But I see a lot of reasons why people accept this as a fact. The first weapon you get in the game is garbage. They might as well rename the Makarov to the Slavic Super Soaker with the amount of damage it does. Not to mention it's very inaccurate. So this is given to you when you're new to the game and still learning how to play, and it's awful. This footage here was me playing the game for the first time in about three years, and this is on the Master difficulty where the bullet damage is the highest. So if someone starts the game on an easier difficulty, they can dump entire magazines into the enemy. So if I had that experience and heard that your bullets just vanish, I'd believe it. You barely have any armor on top of that, and the weapons don't get much better until the next area. This game's probably made tens of thousands of bad impressions, so as odd as it sounds, playing on the hardest difficulty will save you a lot of headaches. It's still going to be very challenging. So why would they design it this way? As harsh as it is, I think I understand what they're trying to teach you. It seems that they were trying to hammer in the fact that this isn't Doom and you can't run around with guns blazing. So the starting area is filled with hazards to reinforce this. Let's yeah, I'd always believe that they think that we are kind of a new, so even I guess uh, we in the game, the protagonist is kind of a new to this thing, right? Even though obviously he's not new as the story progresses, you know it, but I guess amnesia makes him new or something. So with the bad aiming, I mean, you could chalk that up to being a you know rookie experience, like he can't just be expert marksman from the start of the game. I mean, that's how I played it, right? I mean, obviously, as the game progresses, you get re very good, accurate weapons. And even those are not completely accurate. It's not like Far Cry 6. Holy shit, in Far Cry 6, I had a Desert Eagle or something pissed, and I was sniping with it. I mean, come on. Let's start with the anomalies. You can spot them by the weird effects and by listing your detector. Yeah, I think there's one nearby. <laughs> if that's not enough, there are other clues, like spotting a dead animal out in the open. If you're really uncertain, you can toss a metal bolt. What a flying animal. You have an unlimited <laughs> supply of these, and that's a pretty good deal. This is especially good when you compare it to the movie. He only had about three bolts with cloth tied to them, but he had to go and get them. See, this this map here, right, before Yantar, this is such an epic experience because you come close to this tunnel that goes to Yantar and you come across the zombies. Those zombies are supposed to be in Yantar. But the loading screen between this map and Yantar is just there, right? 
So what they added a cool feature like you know those Yantar zombies are kind of leaking out into this map and coming to this tunnel. So the first time you you know see the zombies is in this tunnel it's like what the fuck the experience is ridiculous. This is especially good when you compare it to the movie. He only had about 3 bolts with cloth tied to them, but he had to go and get them every time. That would be rough. Most anomalies he had to worry about were time distortions. It was more about subtle use in sound design, whereas Shadow of Chernobyl is a little more dramatic. How it feels to chew five gum. So right from the start, you're thrown into <laughs> the zone which is full of danger. But even with bad equipment, you have some tools to survive. Rather than fighting it out, sneaking is an option. There are indicators for how visible you are and how much noise you're making. So if you end up being spotted by an NPC, then the visibility marker will go up. So it could be wiser to run and hide rather than fight for the time being. The fact that Stalker doesn't use XP mechanics for its gameplay is beneficial to it. In another game, you'd want to be killing everything in sight to get your XP bar up. But because this game is difficult and your supplies are limited, you don't always want to fight. It's more, more the like survival than the AI than XP means game. can pop on you at any time. Let me elaborate on what I mean by that with an example. Let's say you run across a group of Stalkers fighting some wild dogs. You can help them fight off the dogs and maybe make a new friend, but that can make the other dogs in the pack swarm to you. Even if you survive, this could waste all of your health kits and ammo. You could always kill the stalkers, but that could waste the supplies again. So you have the option of waiting for the dogs to pick them off and then searching their bodies for loot. This guy was even keeping a map to a stash. So by not helping, I got a supply cache marked to my map. So yeah, I essentially got some free stuff. I mean, you can be an asshole in the whole game, but I'm not gonna be that like that, right? I'm a stalker, I'm gonna help the stalkers. What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could get more supply, it'd be more easier, but there's plenty to go around in the whole game. You'll get more things later on, right? <laughs> it's like, okay, sorry, man, survival of the fittest, like, what the fuck, man, help us, nah, man, and just dogs eat them, and, the, you know, our guy just hangs back like that, yeah. <laughs> out of it, but now there are less stalkers in the area to help fight off the bandits, so this fight will be a little more challenging. The AI that the game has is pretty neat. For example, if you do enough damage to a dog pack or maybe kill off their alpha pseudo dog, they'll run off. They'll run away, One example yeah. that stuck out to me was killing a dog for a side quest and then coming back to another dog eating its body. That's neat. So as the yeah. game goes on, you have this weird survivor's economy that starts forming in the back of your brain. Should I really take this fight? Do I really want to look for supplies in this absolute shithole? Do I want to waste ammo on that thing or run for it? If you had great supplies and plenty of ammunition from the start, you wouldn't need to think this way. Giving you a start where you're that underpowered is probably unfair, but man, it sure is effective. When you're improving your skill and getting better equipment, it feels like you've come a long way, but it's still going to be a challenge. One of the ways to make things easier early is the whole draw of the zone, the artifacts. You can equip yeah. five of them at a time. They have a wide range of both drawbacks and positives. Some might increase a damage resist, but decrease your overall endurance. The different effects of artifacts mean they balance each other out. Oh, this but this is better. a hunt. Some might only appear in certain weather conditions at different times of day. Others are specially placed in locations. And no matter what it is, it usually sells well. Some of the effects are a bit vague. Like, I remembered there was a reason that I shouldn't use health artifacts, but I couldn't remember why. And then I remembered, oh yeah, that increases health regen, not your health bar. In fact, it makes you feel even weaker in combat. Increase the health percentage isn't very clear. So the system for being a stalker is great. It's kind of like playing a Pokemon. Yeah, by the way, you think that impact 10%, rupture 10%, that's bullet cap 10% is nothing. But checking your armor, you realize, first of all, if your armor has a 30% bulletproof cap, if it starts to get, you know, damaged, right, it's already going down. He said 20, 18%, now you 10% cut it off. It's like just 8% bulletproof. That's like nothing. Simple fucking pistols would get through. Like you lose, you know, life pretty fast. Percentage isn't very clear. So the system for being a stalker is great. It's kind of like playing a Pokemon game, except you're looking for Ukrainian hell rocks. As brutal as the beginning is, it's essential for teaching you how to play. Because before you get to the good stuff, you've got to start somewhere. For Shadow of Chernobyl, that somewhere is the bottom of the pit from The Dark Knight Rises. Ah, come on, stealth is not gonna work. <laughs> but I did mention about? that things can fall apart. As atmospheric and as good as the gameplay is, there's still a lot of issues. This isn't a game I would call polished. There are bugs like people getting stuck on walls or spawning inside campfires. There's also a funny one where people shoot out of the sides of their weapon. It looks like they're aiming away, but if they pull the trigger, you're dead. One of the more infamous side missions is killing a sniper for the duty faction. The problem is he's usually dead by the time you go to turn it in. Because he usually just stands in his little hut getting killed by said sniper, but not doing anything about it. The zone claims another life. I'm not sure if this counts as a bug, but in one area where you had to go through, I had enemies spawn right on top of me. Oh yeah. That so is annoying. So then I had to spend a while popping in and out to kill them just so I could progress. 
It felt pretty cheap, but I didn't have a choice. I can only be glad that loading new areas only takes a few seconds. Stalker is also notorious for crashing, but I don't have any footage of it because some kind of miracle happened. I played through the entire game with both endings and it didn't crash once. I'm also playing this in modern That's not a miracle. I think the latest uh, one, right, GOG one, uh, has very little crashes, if any, right? It never crashed for me, right, with the latest time I played it. So I guess it's kind of stable. ...hardware with Windows 10, so you'd think it'd be breaking more. I've had it crash before on other computers, though, so I'm still gonna say it's probably unstable. A lot of people say the best way to play vanilla is to install the complete mod because it fixes all the bugs. Don't do that. The complete mod comes mm -hmm. with a lot of gameplay changes that make the game easier. Items like repair kits take away a lot of the scavenging aspect. So don't let them sell it to you as a fix, it's a mod. For a vanilla experience that's stopped- Yeah, Stalker um, Complete is kind of makes the game look smoother, neater. Aiming is better, I guess. But it just it just takes away your whole experience of a Stalker, right? Vanilla is best, I think. Some mod that doesn't change anything, just fixes something, just look for that. Bumps out a lot of bugs. Look into the zone reclamation project. I didn't have it installed for yeah, this playthrough. Some of the bugs are alright. Get out of here, stalker. Get out of here, stalker. Yo, yeah, well, I don't get it why he said that every time. That's the only way in. Get out of here, stalker. I said come in. Don't stand there. I said come in. Don't stand there. Despite all the bugs, it has enough little moments to draw me in still. But it won't be like that for everybody. <laughs> Without getting into spoilers, the ending of the game Cheeky kind of falls blicky. flat. Strictly talking about gameplay, of course. I killed more people in the last three areas than I probably did in the rest of the game combined. It's less about survival management and just more of a battle. The environments it has you fighting in are less like the rest of the game and more like any other FPS game. It made me miss sitting in a bush drinking vodka to get rid of radiation. Plus, there's no more bandits. So if you want to skip story spoilers, go to here. Okay, you're good to go. The first twist is that you are Strelik, which might have been a good twist if it wasn't the only other character by name they gave you. So it's a little predictable, but it's honestly not that important. After putting together clues you find in the zone, you realize that you had made it to the center of the power plant. Stalkers rarely make it that far due to the effect of something called the Brain Scorcher. The Scorcher turns most stalkers into mostly brainless soldiers. Since some can take multiple headshots, that might be more literal than I think. The others join a faction called Monolith. Their sole duty appears to be killing anyone besides them who approaches the center of the zone. So breaking it results in all the factions rushing to the disaster site. The military also launches an all-out offensive to retake the area, so you fight tons of monolith. Those are bodies from just two rooms. When you make it to the sarcophagus, you see that the wish granter is real. There are five possible wishes you make depending on your actions in the game, so you don't get to choose, but they all have a very similar outcome. I want to be rich. If I remember, that's just a hallucination, right? He doesn't the wish grant is a monkey's paw, so any wish made has a tragic but ironic outcome. I think only the novel had a pure wish granter. The other two have some kind of twist to it. I wouldn't call the monkey paw twist terrible for the tone of the game, but the movie did things in a bit more of a clever way. <laughs> <laughs> in the movie, the user's innermost wish is granted. So even though Porcupine came to the zone to help a dead relative, instead he ended up fabulously rich, because that was his true desire. So his ending was tragic out of guilt. Sherlock doesn't have enough character for that kind of ending. But that's okay because this is not the true ending. Mm, yeah, this is I see you have many questions for me. It's not canon. Then ask them. And then we can decide what to do with you. Right. If you follow some clues instead of rushing off to the end, you'll learn about the true nature of the wish granter. The monolith is true. All of it. It is just an illusion manufactured in a lab next to the sarcophagus. And nobody, nobody who reached the monolith has ever come back. So after making preparations, you can enter a secret room in the Chernobyl power plant. You're gonna have to kill a ton of monolith in very tight corridors. The second Chernobyl disaster and the zone itself were created by a group called the Sea Consciousness, or Common Consciousness. The radiation in Chernobyl deterred trespassers, which made it a perfect spot to experiment. They were experimenting on the Noosphere, which is a bit of a complicated subject. It's a sort of living or psychological consciousness that covers the Earth like an atmosphere. It's not easy to define, and they messed it up. So their experiments caused reality to break down around the site. 
they built the Brain Scorcher to enslave stalkers who got too close. Their mistake was assigning Strelok to assassinate himself, which messes up the process or something like that. They offer mm. you a place because they claim they're trying to hold back the zone, but something doesn't add up. The Wish Granter is a final distraction to stop people from figuring out the truth, but when yeah. it's used, the zone expands by five kilometers. So either this is a plot hole or they're lying to me. Maybe I missed something, but I don't trust these people. I overall enjoyed the explanation. It hits a good balance. If you have a story with strange or fantastical elements, explaining too much can ruin it. But they yeah. didn't just throw their arms up and say, we don't know what happened. It's not really a character-driven story, and I know some people can't... Yes, yeah, something just out for, you know, something feels weird, but it's never explained, but it's just open to, you know, interpretation. But I guess it ends in a, it ends in a way without actually explaining some detail in there. That's just the best thing about story, because you can't get all the fucking answers. Understand that, but I'm fine with it because it didn't end up being bad. Okay, let's wrap this up. Even with its messy side mission system and all of its technical blunders, Shadow of Chernobyl is still one oh, of my favorite shooters. Oh yeah, you you had some missions of timer, right? I mean, I remember uh, what was that? Find a rifle or something. Uh, you're supposed to, I guess, the uh, marker. The system is kind of great, right? Marker shows that you're supposed to go to Dark Valley. Because that's where the last time the rifle was seen. But somebody picked it up and went all the way to Agro from underground, right? So, uh, I remember actually going there to the location, like, holy shit, there's nothing there. And then I did the mission there. And for whatever reason, I head, head back to Agro from underground and, you know, killed somebody. And said, oh, holy shit, there is the rifle. And it was very close to the, you know, timer going out. So, I just ran all the way to the bar. The setting and survival gameplay keep it going even 10 years later, even when the survival parts do sort of drop off at the end. And hey, if you're not too sure on the game itself, there's about 10 million mods to try out. Modders are still developing for this game, and with good reason. It's fantastic. Now, if you thought EVE Online was spreadsheets in space, the upcoming video is really going to make you reconsider that. I think that Aurora... Uh, wait, it's coming on PC in like a week? Oh no, this is messing everything up. Thanks for watching. I have some thanking to do. Okay. Oh my god. Yeah, that, that, that last second explains everything. <laughs> you come across some weird looking place, some green nasty is flying up, and you see, suddenly see the eyes and just run like, holy shit, I'm out of here. Yeah. The Pripyat had the, you know, after Saros Chernobyl, Pripyat is kind of like that game because more mutants are introduced slowly as you progress, and the maps are completely different because it's now in a different place. And then also there is this kind of a, you know, radius and storm type of thing that you have to hide away. Oh god, the game is so good, right? If people have time, I guess people should definitely play all three of this game. If you can't play all three of them, at least start with the set of Chernobyl and play Call of Pripyat. Clear Sky is more like a, you know, prequel, but fine, you can skip it, whatever. But the game, Clear Sky, you know, Clear Sky is great in its own way. Alright, well, that was Stalker's set of Chernobyl, my favorite game ever. One of one of my favorite game ever by the channel Mandalore Gaming. If you like my reaction, don't forget to like, subscribe, check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards, check out the in cards, and yeah, I'll see you next time.